Thank you very much, Tarja Halonen and Gunnar Bragi Sveinsson. And now I give the floor to the moderator of the first panel, Niels Einarsson, who is from the Stefansson Arctic <coughs> Institute here in Akureyri. Niels, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christine. Uh, my name is Niels Einarsson, um, director of the Stefansson Arctic Institute, which has been mentioned here in connection with a few projects, including uh, the Arctic Human Development Report 1 and 2, the upcoming two. Uh, I'm extremely happy to be here, and uh, I'm uh, listening to these uh, excellent, inspiring speeches uh, we're setting out on the right foot. Um, and the atmosphere is full of uh, anticipation. It's also full of sulfur dioxide, which, is, which we apologize for. Uh, but we're inside, so we, 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 uh, I hope we will not be, be harmed. Um, now, we have uh, three speakers in this session and uh, uh, one panelist who is also a speaker. And uh, we, will, we will start this broad session. It, this is a, quite a broad session, sort of setting the, the scene, I guess, um, uh, with, um, with uh, uh, a contribution from Canada uh, by Claudia David, who is at the Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development Canada. Uh, Claudia is... Um, she is a human geographer by training. Uh, I don't know anything about Claudia. I've known her for 15 minutes. I will be able to say more about Gunnbrit Retter. I've known her for 15 years. Um, <clears throat> so, Claudia, if you could come up and... Uh, Claudia, I'll give you a presentation. Good morning. Oops. So yes, we only have known each other for about 15 minutes, so hopefully we'll get to know each other a little bit better in the next two days. Um, I am new to this sort of forum. I cannot claim that I'm an expert in uh, gender issues. I do work for the federal government uh, of Canada, and uh, more specifically for the Northern Contaminated Sites Program. And I'm going to link our work that we do on contaminated sites and how it uh, deals with uh, gender issues. So, um, so yeah, we're going to do a, I'm going to do a presentation on gender-based analysis in a northern Canadian context. So my presentation, I'll give you a little bit of a background on Canada's Arctic region in case you're not quite familiar with it. And then I'll follow with um, a history of gender-related uh, policy in Canada and then the application of gender-based analysis in a federal context. So here's a map of Canada. Um, you might be aware that we have 10 provinces, but more importantly, we also have three territories, which is the, the three uh, named here Yukon in the West, Northwest Territories, and then uh, we have uh, a Nunavut. Considerably a small population compared to the rest of Canada. So more specifically in the Yukon, there's a population of about 34,000 people, with the capital being in Whitehorse, and that's where the majority of the people live. Um, namely, about uh, two-thirds of the population uh, live in Whitehorse. And you have some smaller, very much smaller communities uh, spread throughout the territory. In the Northwest Territories, there's 41,000 people. You'll see that the capital in Yellowknife slightly diminishing, uh, nearly half of the population lives, uh, lives in the capital there. And then moving on to Nunavut, uh, you'll see that in the capital of Iqaluit, uh, there's only 22%. Um, so this demonstrates in terms of the Aboriginal people that we have up north. Um, the more you move east, the least of the people, lesser people live actually in, in the, the larger city of the capital. So here you'll see a distribution of the Aboriginal people that we have. As you'll see in the 10 provinces, uh, the percentage is quite low, but as you um, 
look up into three northern territories, uh, the percentage is quite high, uh, about 23% in the Yukon, 52% uh, in the Northwest Territories, and uh, quite high in Nunavut of over 86%. So in terms of the uh, focus on the em employment uh, by sector in, in the three Northern Territories, you'll see that government plays quite a large role, roughly 40% of, um, of people up north who work for the government. And then it's spread between uh, business services, educational services, healthcare, uh, retail, and then um, the other. The 16% of other is a variety of things. There's quite a bit of oil and gas activity up north, as well as the mining industry. So in terms of employment sector by gender, you'll see that um, in terms of government, it's pretty split uh, in, in half. Um, and then we have uh, more discrepancies in the healthcare uh, and social services where there are quite a few more uh, women who work in that sector. Uh, the same for educational services as well. And uh, you see the difference in business services which is more um, male oriented. So a bit of the, the history um, in terms of, of uh, gender related issues in the government of Canada. So almost 20 years ago in 1995, Canada adopted the UN Beijing Platform for Action, which requires all member states to seek and ensure that before policy decisions are taken, an analysis of their impact on women and men respectively is carried out. So in that same year, the government of Canada did commit to conduct, conduct gender-based analysis. For short, I'll use GBA throughout my presentation on all future legislation, policies and program. Since that time, um, GBA has since involved, in, evolved in something we call now GBA plus, as it does not just include, <clears throat> excuse me, um, gender related issues, but also factors in <clears throat> age, education, language, geography, culture, and as well as income. So in terms of the Canadian context, so gender equality is a core Canadian value, which I'm sure it is for most of your countries as well, and is enshrined in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The gender equality means that women and men in all their diversity are able to participate in all spheres of Canadian life. We often assume that gender equality has been fully realized in Canada, and we have made great strides over the years. However, while many advances have indeed been made, equality gaps do still remain. For example, um, young men are actually more likely to drop out of high school than young women, and that women are still more likely than men to look after their homes and their families. The Government of Canada has committed to using GBA in developing all legislation, policies and programs, in helping to identify equality gaps where appropriate in addressing them, and within the context of our work and the environment in which we implement policies and programs. So what is gender-based analysis? It's the process by which a government policy, a program, an initiative, or a service can be examined for its impacts on various groups of men, of women and men. GBA provides a snapshot that captures the realities of women and men affected by a particular issue at a specific time. This means that analysts, researchers, evaluators, and decision makers are able to continually improve their work and attain better results for Canadian men and women by being more responsive to their specific needs and circumstances. So what is a federal department's uh, role in relation to GBA? Um, it's the responsibility that they determine whether there is a potential gender issue uh, within their proposed new policy uh, program or initiative. So based on the results, the Treasury Board Secretariat expects departments to provide evidence that addresses the following questions. Um, there are way more than this, but this is just a snapshot of the type of questions that they ask. So have you identified a gender consideration within the context of the policy? Uh, what is the an anticipated impact? Uh, what evidence did you consider? And also, does your proposed response align 
uh, with gender equality initiatives being undertaken by other organizations as well. Whereas the Treasury Board, so when we do have a new policy initiative in the government, it has to go to the Treasury Board Secretariat, and their role is part of a, a challenge function, if you will, that departments uh, incorporate gender considerations into the design of their policies and programs, and that the differential impacts on men and women are to be identified and addressed so that results are equitable to both genders. So this is uh, mandatory for any cabinet submission or treasury board submission that is made in government. <clears throat> and as we work for, Ab or I work for Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development Canada, in dealing with the Northern Territories, we have even more so customized the GBA um, into some Inuit uh, focused uh, questions, and it includes four steps. Uh, the Inuit way, which has to deal with elders and culture, language, family, community, and spirituality. Traditional influences in terms of land, weather, animals, and country food. The contemporary influences for Aboriginal people, in, in Inuit in particular, the institutions of schools and hospitals, government policies, legislation, the global economy. And finally, assessing gender impacts in an Inuit cultural context, which in terms means pulling together an overall picture of how Inuit women and men are affected by the topic being considered. So that's the framework in terms of the legislation that we have and the policy for gender-based um, issues in Canada. And now I'm gonna speak more specifically on an operational basis on how that is applied. So I work for the um, Northern Affairs Organization, which is um, uh, housed in the Federal Department of Aboriginal Affairs and Northern mm -hmm. Development Canada. Um, its mandate is um, significant and far-reaching and includes uh, the management of resources, land, and environmental management responsibilities. So as I mentioned before, I work for the contaminated sites program, which is listed at the bottom. However, there are many other programs that this organization deals with, including devolution, climate change, nutrition north, mineral and oil and gas resources, and environmental assessment. So putting GBA into action, I'm gonna focus on uh, two programs actually. There's the Canadian High Arctic Research Station that is currently being built and uh, the Northern Contaminated Sites Program, which is the program that I work for. So I'm gonna start off with the Canadian High Arctic Research Station. For short, we say CHARS. Um, it's a year-round facility for world-class science and technology in Canada's Arctic. It's uh, being built in Cambridge Bay in Nunavut. The station will include research labs, a center for technology development and traditional knowledge, and facilities for teaching, training, and community engagement. The science and technology undertaken by CHARS will include various disciplines such as natural and physical sciences, economic and social sciences, health and life sciences, the humanities, engineering and technology development. The station is planned to be operational in 2018. So in terms of its gender context with this project, uh, Northerners, in particular women, have identified concerns regarding their ability to participate directly in the growing non-renewable resource extraction industries, as well as the gender impacts of these industries. So skilled trades are traditionally dominated by men, and I think this is an understanding not just in the North, but across Canada as well. Statistics reveal that Northerners, and in particular Aboriginal people, have lower educational attainment than their Southern counterparts, and that Northern males have on average lower educational attainment levels than Northern women. So in terms of the GBA findings in relation to CHARS, as the project moves forward, it'll be important to ensure that both men and women are equally included and targeted in knowledge, application activities, and delivery. And to ensure capacity building and outreach activities through educational attainment, meaning to encourage greater participation of young people in polar science, and outreach activities should be developed using a gendered approach. So 
So moving on to the Northern Contaminated Sites Program. The program is responsible for the remediation of contaminated sites in the territories. Um, the result of these contaminated sites are, for the most part, the result of the private sector mining and oil and gas activities and government military activities that occurred over half a century ago when environmental impacts were not fully understood. So the government of Canada has to remediate these sites as the private sector walked away from the mining um, industry about 15 years ago when the prices of gold and silver were quite low and uh, filed for bankruptcy and walked away, and hence why we're responsible in remediating these sites. So in terms of the gender context of the Northern Contaminated Sites Program, so specific to impacts on women, a challenge um, would be getting direct employment with these uh, projects. Construction and mining professions are male-dominated industries, and many women may not have the work or training experience to participate. Another reason being that, for the most part, in Aboriginal communities as well, women do tend to be the primary caregiver for their families, and as well, the sites that we work on are very, very remote and isolated. Clearly, there are advantages for men, as the work of the construction phase at contaminated sites um, is, uh, is male dominated. So for example, in the Northwest Territories, only 6.4% of total people employed in the trades, transport and equipment operators uh, were, were, met, were women. And in Nunavut, that number was only 3.7%, and in the Yukon, 5.9%. So due to the physical nature of the work undertaken uh, during the construction phase of our contaminated sites, elders and people with disabilities would also be at a, at a disadvantage for employment opportunities. So in terms of the GBA findings for this program, overall the potential impacts are positive for both women and men because the remediation of various hazardous materials will prevent the contamination from coming in contact with the public. Uh, these projects are benefiting both the environment and socioeconomic, um, socioeconomics of their areas. However, as I mentioned, um, more beneficial for men tr um, trying to find employment rather than women. But overall, people will be pleased to see the sites remediated and the risks associated with such sites eliminated or significantly diminished. Furthermore, this initiative will provide direct employment, support to local businesses through the procurement of goods and services, and training to help build the capacity of local community members and provide opportunities to obtain future work based on new skills acquired. So to conclude, um, the gender-based analysis in government does play an important role in providing decision makers with valuable information on the impact to men and women to propose legislation, policies and programs, and also to already existing initiatives. It allows for senior management to continually improve their work and attain better results for Canadian men and women by being more responsive to their specific needs and circumstances through gender-based analysis. Thank you. I think Claudia is willing to take uh, one or two quick questions. Yes. That would be very interesting to know that what has been the response of the uh, indigenous peoples in your programs? How active they have been? Uh, they have been quite active. Um, in, in our department being Aboriginal Affairs, uh, we do a lot of consultation and engagement with Aboriginal people and just northern communities in general. So when we do our gender-based analysis, a lot of the information we get is through those consultation sessions so that we know how women or men or elders uh, feel about our programs and that helps us feed the analysis and that's how we determine what can be done more so for example, for contaminated sites, we do set aside some funding for training for employment, both men and women, so that they can work at our sites. Very good. Thank you. Um, there's a question. Oh, there's
was. Thank you. Um, one was you, you mentioned um, construction and mining professions that many women do not have the working experience or training to take on those jobs. Um, and then you also mentioned that some of the cleaning up of the contaminated sites would uh, entail training for transformative skills, enabling new businesses. Mm -hmm. And so I have two questions. One is, what is being cleaned up? What is the contamination in the uh, territories? And uh, another one, are there any studies being made on the wishes of women in the region for a professional career? Do they involve being employed in the mining activities? Yeah, so to answer your first question, um, contaminated sites in the north is, there for the most part are abandoned mines and military sites. So abandoned mines, uh, as I mentioned during my presentation, uh, a lot of the companies filed for bankruptcy, and unfortunately at the time there weren't any securities in place uh, for them to clean up their site, the sites themselves. And so uh, Canada didn't have the legislation in place to do anything against it. So we are essentially stuck cleaning up abandoned mines, unfortunately, at a very high cost to taxpayers. And so they are uh, mostly in the Yukon and the Northwest Territories in very isolated areas that we have these abandoned gold, uh, silver, and lead and zinc mines. The military sites as well have uh, PCBs um, that need to be uh, taken care of. And those were actually military sites during the Cold War um, that were installed with radar stations. And um, in terms of your second question, in terms of uh, when women are working there, as mentioned, the sites are very, very isolated and traditionally Abor Aboriginal women do take care of their children at home. So it, it makes it difficult for them to leave, um, to go to work in these isolated areas. Often um, it's, it's shift work where they're two weeks at the site, one week home. And so when you're taking care of young children, women don't tend to go for those kinds of jobs. So. Okay. Thank you, Claudia, for this excellent presentation. Uh, before the next speaker, I just have like, uh, well, two announcements, uh, one of them relatively innocent. Uh, that has to do with it. Atli Maur Sigurdsson from the Foreign Ministry, he has, he has uh, two, um, two um, things that he, he will be waving. One means that you have three minutes left, the other one that you have nothing left, <laughs> because time flies like an arrow. Uh, <coughs> and. Uh, uh, now that has just has to do with the discipline and punctuality. The other one is that you notice that we Icelanders, we've been fiddling a lot with our mobile phones. And that uh, we just got an announcement from the authorities that, uh, that the, uh, the pollution levels have reached like a critical stage here in the Eyjafjörður. Not Nothing extremely dangerous. It's just that you are, you are <laughs> advice to stay inside <laughs> and uh, not go on any long walking tours in the mountains. Um, so, uh, and if there is anyone who, who has respiratory problems of any kind, ailments, a sensitive person of that kind, then just keep us informed. Um, but everything should be, should be fine. Now, uh, I think it's just very appropriate, because speaking of bad air quality and pollution issues, to uh, introduce the ne next uh, speaker, Gunn Britt Retter, who is actually uh, the head of the Arctic and Environmental Unit of the Sami Council, so she knows a lot about these things, and has probably been in much worse places in the Arctic, where this would be like a normal situation. <clears throat> and uh, uh, Gunnbrit, uh, Gunnbrit Retter is, uh, she's a Sami from Nesebi in Varanger in Finnmark, Norwegian Finnmark. Um, 
she is an active spokesperson on issues in terms of indigenous rights, languages, uh, biodiversity, pollution, of course, um, or not least from a gender perspective. And um, um, she, used to, she used to be, and that's how I, I, I got to know her many years ago, uh, she used to work at the uh, Arctic Council Indigenous People Secretariat in Copenhagen. Um, but she is also, uh, she also had an advanced degree in uh, bilingual studies, uh, and she is uh, not just bilingual, she is also a polyglot, as I know her. So, Gunnbrit, if you would like to take the floor, please. I have my own cup. Oh, you you just feel water. <laughs> oh, sorry. Thank you for that uh, excellent introduction. Uh, former President Tarja Halonen and Foreign Minister, other participants. A year ago, I saw a photo from one of the main plenaries at the Arctic Circle conference that takes place in Reykjavik at a yearly basis now. The motive was six men in their middle age, or middle age plus, wearing dark suits. And the comment attached to the photo quoted the chair, introducing the panel as a ve very diverse one. <laughs> Since the previous gender equality conference initiated by the Arctic Council took place 12 years ago in Suolochirike, Saariselke, in Inari in the northern Finland in 2002, uh, we have seen a boom, both in the Arctic and outside. And now you are wondering what boom this is. It is a boom about our conferences about the Arctic. The biggest ones and the ones that attract most participants and attention focus on opportunities and challenges within the energy sector, extractive industries, and infrastructure to transport the resources out from the Arctic. Furthermore, all the Arctic states have developed Arctic strategies during the last decade, during the last decades, and also countries outside the Arctic are developing these kind of strategies. Uh, even states outside the Arctic having interests in the Arctic, investors and foundations that develop these kind of uh, Arctic strategies, mainly focusing on opportunities and challenges. And that's what we all like to focus on. But this mainly focus on how to best access the Arctic. The impression left with people in general, I would claim, is a one-sided focus on economic development with a touch of required concern for the environment and indigenous peoples as a cultural component towards the end. Gender-related questions, I believe, are mostly left out. And just to remind a uh, gender issue, just to remind you all, uh, it was also said before, gender issue is not solely a women's issue. However, I perceive the Arctic agenda is being very masculine, like the photo from the Arctic Circle plenary last year, where diver diversity is defined within a very narrow scope. Within the current Arctic discourse, there seems to be less room and funding for themes within social science that would also address questions regarding gender equality and indigenous peoples, and, well, people in general, people and societies in general. Sami Council, which is uh, the organization I represent, that uh, is an umbrella organization for Sami people uh, living in northern Norway, Finland, Sweden, and northwest Russia, uh, we welcome Iceland's initiative within the Arctic Council to organize the second conference on gender equality uh, in, the, in the Arctic Council. There are, many, there are many things I could have focused on, 
But in this very short presentation, I will focus, and I just uh, got a new word that I can play around with, I will focus on the unsmart societies I sense are developing in the North. And I have no PowerPoint, so you have to visualize by yourself. Back to the boom of Arctic-related conferences. If all the wet dreams presented at those Arctic conferences uh, came true, what kind of Arctic would we see then? I will use the most damaging business of them all as an example. That is mining. There is excitement about starting up a mine in Repparfjord in Finnmark, in Norway, in a municipality where 3% of the population is unemployed today. Uh, and there is not more uh, unemployment in the surrounding communities. This is a neighbor uh, community to Hammerfest, which you might have heard about with the gas plant. So the workforce force, uh, targeted for this, this mine must most likely be imported from somewhere. Another example is in Sweden, the LKAB iron mine in Giron, Kiruna, most known to some of you as a place where the recent Arctic Council ministerial meeting took place, is among the big largest mines of its kind in the world, and it keeps expanding, regardless of the fact that the very same fields already are used parts of the year for reindeer herding by a reindeer herding district that is already stretched to the limit of its existence due to mining in its area. These are cases Sami Council has practically worked on, but there are other examples as well. Norway and Sweden that we know most in these cases, there might be the same case if we studied carefully both in Russia and Finland, but Norway and Sweden largely justifies their wish to promote mining activities in the Sami area that this is necessary to achieve development. But development is not a term of art. It has different meanings for different peoples and cultures. And the Sami Council submits that it is not less development that an area can be used for reindeer herding, hunting, fishing, recreational and ecotourism purposes for thousands of years than it be used for mining purposes for 20 years whereafter the area is destroyed forever. Neither is the Arctic an empty space with some scattered people just waiting to get some economic development to be brought to us. The Sami people's traditional livelihoods, like reindeer herding and small-scale fisheries, have existed in the Sami areas over millennia as a sustainable economy in the high north that has outlasted the Stone Age, the Vikings, medieval area, early industrialization, and still flourish in the present times, and also represent future development of the Arctic region. Through these livelihoods, the people have developed unique knowledge that we refer to as traditional knowledge about living in the North. Why do these livelihoods remain a cultural component in the Arctic strategies? How do we make the opportunities in the Arctic to be opportunities for all, women and men, indigenous and non-indigenous? Sami Council will continue to work towards changing the framework regulating the traditional sustainable livelihoods to ensure that these can represent the developing economy in the North, in that way to ensure sustainable and productive communities in the North. And since uh, I have only a few minutes and I can't go into all details, it's easiest to push it to the extreme. Are we going to repeat the same old story by promoting to put an end to traditional sustainable livelihoods like fishing and reindeer herding, to replace it with mining and other exploiting industries, to replace family-based businesses with far more male-dominated industries? While it is still the case, that more women leave the communities to get higher education and too often do not return to small communities afterwards. Why is it still more beneficial to facilitate exploitation of non-renewable resources while development based on renewable resources do not seem to be beneficial to process on, on shore or in the, in the north? 
So I think there is an urgent need to strengthen the framework to ensure, and the phrase that uh, Mrs. Hallonen used, to ensure smart investments, to ensure opportunities for all and gender-balanced, sustainable communities. Uh, so you haven't flagged yet with the... Yeah. <laughs> so I could... Um, since the last uh, gender conference, Arctic Council uh, has also gained much more attention over the last 10 years, much due to the climate change work and, and um, yeah, a lot of interest from outside of the Arctic. So Arctic Council, I, I would claim, has been among those who have been able to, to address other values than only economic development. And we see that from the uh, Arctic Human Development Report that was mentioned earlier that will be published later this year. There is a focus on human health and well-being during the Canadian chairmanship. And uh, actually, I have to admit also the last senior Arctic official meeting in Yellowknife last week was quite touching as well and moving by hearing the stories from the local indigenous peoples uh, attending the meeting. And we have a focus on Arctic indigenous languages. So uh, there is, there is a, a wider palette to, the, to not only Arctic energy focusing conferences, there are other initiatives going on. But uh, the, that, the description of the mining story as an example is a current reality, how I, the, uh, what I have been describing here it, uh, the, is the current reality, how I see it from my perspective, uh, and it also represents the future challenges. And I think the photo presenting a diverse panel at the Arctic Conference should contain of representatives of both women and men, youth and elders, indigenous, non-indigenous, representing various livelihoods, fishing and mining, to have an Arctic dialogue on equal terms and re respecting each other's needs and interests. And in that way, I would again repeat the phrase, this will be a smart investment. So I would like to join that kind of conference in the future. And if you've managed that, we only need one Arctic conference. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Gunbrit says that she will be able to take one or two questions if there are any. Yes. There is one. about the jobs that you want and you see that we should rather create in those rural areas because that's a common problem for us all on, on the rural areas. The women are leaving because they have so much uh, education that they do not have jobs um, that they want to seek at home. Because uh, we have some experience of that. And we can, of course, uh, encourage the big companies that are coming to uh, try to create valuable jobs also for women. What kind of jobs do you see? And do you think it's not possible for the mining companies to try to have that project? Thank you, it's a, it's a very good question. Uh, I, what kind of jobs would you, th I would have loved to have the opportunity to, to um, well, now I have had many opportunities in my life, but when I was younger, I thought that I could live the same way of life that my, my family had done. And that is a combination of the livelihoods in the, like fishing and gathering and uh, hunting and, and the harvesting, small scale farming. But, but it wasn't promoted as an opportunity when, in the 70s when I grew up. And I think there's, and the same goes with, with reindeer herding and fisheries, and I think we should uh, I don't understand why it's not possible to... There is something with the framework and regulations that does it not beneficiary to, to develop those uh, renewable resource industry. So it is something with the delivery line and the mechanisms that does 
that people tell me that it's not um, money enough in that. It's not, you don't make money in those businesses. But there must be something that could be done to change this. Because why is it more beneficiary or more, why is it more money in 20 years of mining or 30 years of mining? Or why is it, the people need food too. I mean, that is also a need for people. So, but of course, and there is some mining already and there must be room for some mining and some other exploitive uh, industry. And uh, of course, there can be a dialogue with, with the industry companies coming on, on what kind of work that they have, that they have their strategic or planning offices also based in the north. And I think there are some, some of that kind of initiatives in the north already that they establish uh, offices also in, in the north. But uh, another thing, um, actually, I was surprised to see that, that um, it's still a trend that women doesn't come back. Because in my community, there's a lot of young, relatively young, I have to say, you know, women that has moved back to the community to, to work in, the, well, it's mostly administration and, and so on, but they want to live in the communities. So I was surprised to see that that wasn't a trend yet all over, only in, in my community. And the other thing is that I know quite a number of, of young men in the Sami associations that I work in, and they have been very clear that they don't want to work in mines. They want to have a different future. So I think that maybe answers your question. Thank you for, for this excellent presentation. Um, we are, I believe, uh, 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 there's a big conference starting up in Reykjavik, the Arctic Circle, with uh, thousands and thousands, well, at least almost a thousand people attending from all corners of the world. Um, I know that one of the sessions has to do with corporate responsibility, an extremely important issue, I think. Um, and uh, in, in fact, Emblay Rodstotter, who's here with us, is organizing that one. And I'm sure the idea, idea of a, a smart societies in the Arctic taking gender issues seriously in terms of human welfare and equity issues is, should be one of the key issues to, to be discussed at such a session, because obviously the companies have a major responsibility and will be shaping the future and, and addressing these challenges. Um, now, the, the, our next speaker, uh, before <coughs> the panelist and speaker, uh, Eriku Björgensson, uh, the next speaker is uh, Kristin Ásgeisdóttir. She is the director of the Icelandic Center for Gender Equality, a core institute uh, in the flora of Icelandic uh, governmental agencies, um, and a very prominent one. Um, uh, she is, has, uh, before taking on the responsibility of, of her present job, she was uh, active with, for the Center for Women and Gender Research at the University of Iceland. She has worked as uh, a project manager for UNIFEM in Kosovo, and she's also been uh, a member of Parliament for the Women's Alliance. Last but not le least, she was one of the three members of the Icelandic Parliament Special Investigation Committee on the collapse of the financial or banking sector in Iceland, uh, a committee which dealt with the ethical side of the collapse, which were many and profound. Um, Christine. Thank you very much, Niels, and Atli, please keep an eye on me. I tend to talk for too long. I have so much to say. Uh, first of all, I want to say that, that uh, uh, I have been working on gender equality for a very long time, and I tend to look at gender equality in Iceland from a, a European perspective or the UN perspective. So thinking about us in this Arctic context is something new for me. And in preparing this conference, I, I have learned a lot of, about what we have in, in common and, and uh, what, uh, you know, there, there are, are differences, but <clears throat> we have a lot in common. And uh, I think that, that we need to, really need to continue uh, this work. 
What I'm going to do here today is to give you a picture of gender equality here in, here in Iceland. And uh, as the Minister for Foreign Affairs mentioned, we have been heading or top the World Economic Forum's Gender Gap Index for the last six years. We are, of course, very proud of this. But, uh, you know, we can ask uh, questions about these measurements. Uh, are they the most important or not? But uh, at least uh, it's a, a, this index compares over 100 countries in the world. So we can easily see where we stand on, on those issues that are, are measured there. And, and this index, it, it measures uh, health, education, uh, economic power, and, uh, and uh, politics, <laughs> participation in decision making. And uh, the main reasons for Iceland to top the list is, is that we have been doing very well in education, health, and, uh, and politics. But it's the labor market which is our, our worst, worst site, or, or the weakest site. And we can say that Iceland is not yet a women's paradise. It's, it's neither a men's paradise. And don't know if we will ever reach that goal. But it's, it's interesting in this context to look at the methods that we have used here in, here in Iceland. And we, of course, have a legislation. We have many legislations. Uh, the there has been an, an uh, in, in one of the articles of the Constitution, stated that men and women should be equal in, in every way since 1995, same year as the Beijing conference was held. And uh, we have built up institutional mechanisms as, as uh, due to the, the seat of convention and, and the Beijing convention. Uh, we have seen negotiations on the labor market where gender issues have been discussed, like, like the parental leave which was an initiative uh, from the labor market, mostly. It, it's very much debated who owns that, who owns the, 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 the parental leave, which is one of the things that we are, are very proud of and, and have meant a lot in, in developing the Icelandic uh, society. Uh, our legislation allows affirmative actions. We have not done a lot of them, but it's, it's allowed. And, and the law includes positive duties for the labor market. Uh, the companies with 25 employees or more need to have action plans on gender equality. And, and it's one of the main uh, work that we do in, at the Center for Gender Equality is have, looking at these, these uh, gender equality action plans and discussing them with the uh, businesses or institutions or, or whatever it is. We have used quotas here in Iceland. We have quotas on every committee or board, official boards here in Iceland, and as well in, in enterprises where there are 50 employees or, or more, legislation from 2011. And, and it's also a quota on, on the pension funds, which are, we can say, are quite powerful in the Icelandic economy. And of course, uh, there have been actions and lobbyism and, and all kinds of pressures, mostly from women's movements here in, in the country. And last but not least, we have international obligations, as I mentioned, in, which are mentioned in, in the seat of convention and the Beijing Platform for Action, di and directives from EU, which we have, have uh, implemented. Here you see, can see, just to give you a picture of what has happened, here you see the, the development in the parliament where the number of, of women in 1971, there were, there were three women in, in the Icelandic parliament, 5%, uh, now, now it's uh, 40, about 40%. Here you see the same development in local governments, in the municipalities, uh, there is a new figure for, for 2014, the, the number of women rose to 44%. So we are almost equal there. Uh, this is something very, very interesting. The, looking at families in, in Iceland, uh, we tend to, to think that, that most families are, are families with, with, uh, with children, but the biggest part is, is families with 
where there are no, where there are no children under the age of, of 18, there can be children older than that, and also the, the number of mothers, single mothers with, with children is, is something very special here, uh, quite special here, here in Iceland compared for, with the European countries. One of the main reasons for the development in, in Iceland is the high participation of, of women on, on the labor market. And 65% of women have a full-time job, 86% of men, you see these differences. And 35% of, of women here in Iceland have a part-time job. Uh, in, in November there will be a Nordic conference on, on, in Reykjavik on, on, uh, on part-time jobs and what they mean for the individual and the, and the families, as well as a, a, a conference on, on uh, the gender pay gap. And we have seen that there are more and more women have a full-time job and uh, the working, their working day is getting longer while, while men's working day is getting shorter. So this gap is, is narrowing. And here you see the, the development on, on the labor market, how the participation of, of women have, have risen. It was quite high in the 20s and 30s. But uh, then uh, the big change was between 1960 and 1980. And uh, be behind, I'm coming to that, what is behind this, if time allows. And as I mentioned, uh, parental leave ha has played a, cru a crucial role in, in uh, increasing gender equality in, in, in Iceland. It's now uh, th uh, three months for the mother, three for the father, non-transferable, and three to, to share. And the plan was to have 12 months, I'm not going, but it has been, been postponed for a while at least. The, the, the system we have is what we call three plus three plus three. The system that was to be developed was, was called five plus five plus two, and we will have to see, see what happens. And what is very important for gender equality in Iceland is, is the, the system, the preschool system that has been built up in this country since the 1990s. And now 95% of children between the age of three and five go to preschool. And this is crucial. Here you see how, how the parental leave has been uh, used. Of course, uh, you know, more mothers take leave than, than men and, and for a, a, a longer time. <clears throat> and, uh, well, be, behind, behind this, these changes I have been describing are, are economic and, and social uh, forces. Uh, and, and that we have seen a, what we could call a, a transformation for the last uh, 50 years. And there was a huge economic growth. The, the labor market needed workforce, and, and the women came out. And this is what we call the dual breadwinner model that characterizes the Nordic countries, while, while in some other countries uh, they, they imported workforce, like Germany, for example. In, in the Nordic countries, it's the women who were given the chance to, for, to edu get education and, and have, a, have a job. And uh, yes, I'm not going deeply into this. I have, I, we can maybe discuss this. And, and we have some interesting, uh, we co interesting things when we look at the tax system. I, I always like to, to mention that this, that in 1957, the parliament decided that married women should only pay 50% income tax, while men paid 100. And, and uh, well, the, it says in, in uh, the parliament said that, that this was be because the, the women, you know, if they did go out and have a job, they had to hire some, someone to do the, the work at home. It wasn't the question that, that the, the man or the, the husband could do some of the job. They had to, this is very, very interesting. But th this is a kind of an affirmative action that, uh, a very, very, very interesting one. And it, well, it meant, yeah, our time is running out. So, mm, we will just, uh, just go to the, the challenges. You can ask me about the history later on if, if, you, if you like. So, uh, although that, as I mentioned, we have seen great changes, confirmation in the Icelandic society, but there are, there are many challenges. And uh, it's, uh, 
Men in, in, in general still have long working week on the labor market, and that affects the, the family and the sharing of housework. Sharing of housework is not equal. And uh, most women still bear the double burden of work and, and family responsibilities, also, although that's changing. And professions where women are in majority are undervalued. I'm sure you know, all of you know, know this phenomenon. And uh, education, although women have got enormous education in, in, here in Iceland, it has not secured uh, gender equality. And the level of, of women's education is growing fast, while the dropout of young men is a problem. And what we have to ask ourselves, what will the consequences be in, in the future? And women are still a, majority, a minority among those running enterprises, but it's changing rapidly because of the quota legislation, 2010, it says here, yeah. And the gender pay gap is narrowing very slowly. Sharing of housework is not equal, and it's very traditional. And I'd like to draw your attention to, to this picture, uh, especially the differences between men and women where uh, university education is, is concerned. And this is really, really worrying. Here you see a picture of the gender pay gap and the gender segregated labor market. The, these, these are pictures very similar to what we see in the, in the Nordic countries. Board women on boards, sorry, it's a very bad, bad uh, picture. So uh, my conclusion is that although we have seen changes in, in the last 50 years or, or so, it's always a question how far back we should uh, look. Uh, there is a, a lot of things that we need to improve and we have been taking taking steps in, in recent years, and, and I really hope that we will continue to, to do so. And uh, we have this gender, pay, gender uh, equality index, and I was thinking it would be very interesting to have such an, an index for the Arctic, <clears throat> because these, this index as we see today is, is for the whole countries, but if we would take the Arctic, for example, in, in, in Canada or Russia or, or, or Norway, Sweden, Finland, and, and compare with, with the rest of the countries, I think that might be, might be very, very interesting. So finally, it, it's, uh, gender equality is a smart business, and it, as has been said, said here, and it's a question of respecting human rights and creating a more equal, just, and fair society. And the Arctic, of course, needs gender equality. Thank you. Now it's the panel. A question on the phone. I just want to continue in hot pursuit of Christine's last words that uh, I think it is a well-known fact within e economics that, uh, that inequality is inefficient. Um, and that also has to do with gender equality. Um, Christine, uh, did you, are you able, do you have time to take one or two questions perhaps? It was the Ministry for Welfare calling, <laughs> asking for, for the, the minute, you know, the, there is a change in the program. The Minister for Gender Equality is coming here tomorrow, in, uh, tomorrow morning, and, uh, and uh, I was assisting with some points for the, the speech. So they were asking, where is the speech? <laughs> okay, any questions? Yeah. yeah, I had, I had a question. Uh, my name is Eva Maria Svensson, uh, and I think the, the uh, image that you show of uh, gender equality in Iceland is uh, it, it's almost the same in all the Nordic countries. And that explains why we actually are the most gender equal countries in the world. We have the, well, Sweden is only now in the fifth posi position, but it's, 
uh, yeah, but the Nordic countries are uh, on the top. But I think I had two, uh, two uh, things to add, and when you um, presented the figures for uh, how much uh, men and women work, uh, it's not uh, the whole uh, picture, because if you add the unpaid work, yes. uh, mm. actually women work more mm. than men, but women get less uh, paid for than men. And uh, when you mentioned the, <laughs> the system uh, where you had some, someone working in your home in the 50s, people laughed here, but that is exactly what we have introduced in, in Sweden again, uh, that we have tax reductions for people working in your home uh, through the schemes of root and root. So exactly, we have the same situation now again. Do we mm. laugh at that? <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's right. We, we see the same thing here, but I, I, as far as I know, there are no tax reductions. I, I don't think so. But, uh, yeah, as you say, that I was talking about paid, uh, paid work and, and, you know, participation on the labor market, but you're, of course, right that, that we have to take into account the work at home and c taking care of children. And, and uh, especially, I, 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 I'm trying wherever I can, to, to draw the, the attention to, well, it's of course not a new phenomenon, but, but something that is growing rapidly, and that's taking care of, of old parents and, and sick relatives, and, and how the society, what kind of services the, the society is building up. And this is taking a lot of, of time. For, and, and we need, to, it would be interesting to, to look at how, who is doing that. But we don't have, any research on that, as far as I know. So, um, I was interested about this uh, taxation issue, because we have not that, but we have made another one, which might be the answer what what you said already. We have the certain, uh, we can reduce the tax, in the, or use it in taxation, that if you have somebody working in your households, looking after the babies, or looking after the elderly people, or even the repairing the the something in your home, which means also that uh, the male work is considered to be such kind of things, perhaps. So, uh, so that we can make a certain reduction. It's uh, it's now to to. Uh, I I don't remember exact numbers, but uh, something like. Uh, uh, it, it's quite quite much anyway in in Europe. We can give it in later on. But, uh, but the question of my, what, what I wanted to do is that, uh, have you noticed that the caring traditionally in the society is something feminine, women? And, and uh, it's in yin and yang in China, it's, it's in, uh, in uh, many other issues. But why I wanted already to make this question concerning the Arctic Circle is that if you take the traditional Arctic society, so uh, it, there is also the certain share of the work concerning the gender, um, but the gender heading has been also for women, at least in the, some of the northern countries, that uh, the women can have also the ownership for the reindeer and so on. But, uh, but it would be very interesting to see that whether this caring is only the, the good for women, that caring is a female, caring environment, uh, it's also the welfare society, education, health, and social, they are all caring in a, in a sense. And that's why the girls tend to also to take the studies of caring, and they will be more paid in, in the system where the men's jobs, the traditional men's jobs, they are disappearing because it's, it's not too much in, in, in hunting and so on. But, but now uh, mining is also male, more male. It's, it's to take, and it, it gives a higher respect. In, in that way, I think that when you have these research centers, it would be very interesting if you could restudy again what's male and what's female, and then we come to the roles of the man and the woman, that if you have not so clear uh, definition what is to be a man and what is to be a woman, it might help also in this sectorized labor markets and everything that what's, what's men or women. So, but um, really, in taxation, we have one model, what we could, you could use, and we can 
give later on, Ina will give the, the exact figures during the day, that's how we do it. Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> well, I, I, I didn't mention that, that the law was changed in the 1970s. That in, uh, when the red stocking movement uh, started in, in 1970, they pointed out how, how extremely unfair the, the tax system was. You know, it was not only a, a question about gender equality, but, but uh, for uh, you know, married women, they paid 50% tax and encouragement for, for getting married, but, but single mothers, you know, they paid 100% tax. And they had to do all the, you know, all the, both bringing up the children, working, bringing up the children, and, and, and doing all the homework. So, so this was very unfair, and uh, the law was changed in the, in the 70s. And, and uh, of course, we have the same characteristic for, for I think, all, all the Nordic countries, at least, in, when it comes to caring. The labor market is, is very gender segregated, and, and that's one of the things that we want to change. We want to see more men in, in caring. And yeah, yes, <laughs> caring men. And, and uh, yes, and, and, and see, see women, uh, more women in, in, technic, te in the technical field, uh, computers and, and so on. Uh, well, uh, there are at least two questions. We, we, there is a panel, it's starting. I think we should take the questions, yes. shouldn't we? Yeah. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Christine. Um, we, have, we have one speaker left uh, on uh, this session, and I suggest that those participating in the panel could use the opportunity to move over to the, to the uh, high table here, uh, the panel, uh, while I introduce the next speaker to be to, in, in the name of efficiency. Yes, you can just take a seat, Christine. Sorry, yes, Claudia. Uh, next speaker is uh, Erge Björn Björgesson. He is the, the very popular mayor of uh, Akureyri. In fact, he is so popular that uh, a new political majority uh, uh, decided to keep him uh, because of the excellent job he is doing. He has been a, a great supporter and good friend of uh, Arctic issues and projects and programs and institutes in Akureyri. Uh, and a spokesperson for, for those of us who, who are engaged in making Akureyri uh, the, uh, well, perhaps not, uh, perhaps not the capital of the north. I think that's Tromsø, according to the Norwegians. Uh, but at least uh, the, Ar the, uh, the, the capital of the Arctic in, in, in Iceland. Uh, Erikur. Well, Foreign Minister, former President of Finland, uh, MPs and distinguished guests. Uh, first of all, as a mayor of Akureyri, I want to welcome you all, at least our guests, to our beautiful town of Akureyri. It is an honor to have you all here. Uh, and it is also an honor to uh, have the opportunity to have you all here in our conference in, and uh, and the center here, and the uh, cultural center here in, in, in Akureyri. So please, a warm welcome to you all. But I have the opportunity to say a few words before we, I take a seat in the panel. Well, the population of Akureyri today is around 18,000 people, about 49% of whom are men and 51% women. Akureyri is the largest municipality outside of the capital area of Iceland, and uh, one of very few municipalities outside of the capital area where women uh, are, uh, where more women uh, are here than men, are living than men. The smaller rural municipalities in Iceland face the problem of having more men than women among their inhabitants, a fact that makes an imbalance in the communities. Some 10 years ago, a research was conducted on why women move but men stay in smaller communities in Iceland, the Faroe Island, Greenland, and the northern Scandinavia. The results showed that women were more likely than men to seek education and new opportunities. 
So if the communities they lived in did not offer challenging opportunities for them in education or work, they moved to a larger towns or cities. A study made in 2009 showed that most important reason for relocation of women aged of 20 to 39 were found to be education, job-related issues, and high salaries in urban areas than in the rural areas. So why has Akure not had this problem? The University of Akure was founded in 1987, and that made a big difference for many of the young people living in Akure and the surroundings. And it is also gave women who had no uh, gained higher education earlier the opportunity to continue living in Akure with their families and also to do their university studies. Before the university was established, Akureyri already had six elementary schools, two junior colleges, 11 kindergartens, art school and a music school. So it's evident that we truly place high emphasis on good education for our citizens. And it is also provides jobs for educated people, both men and women. The municipality itself is a large employee schools and all kinds of public services. And so are the university and the regional hospital. These employers provide public service. That is a great number done by women, teachers, nurses, and so on. In Iceland, women do more jobs in the public sector than men, but the fact is that the most public jobs are done in the capital area. The municipality outside of the capital area that offers most public jobs is Akureyri. So one of the things that needs to be looked at when making com communities more attractive to both men and women is job opportunities in the public sector, as well, of, of course, as in the private. This leads us to policy making decision and decision making concerning rural development, which needs to be looked at with so-called gender classes and needs to be made by both men and women. Fortunately, the presence of women in the parliament and municipalities has gradually, gradually increased, as we saw earlier, and thereby the opportunities for women to access policy making and decision making. Akureyri has, since 2002, had a quite even number of men and women in the town council and as uh, the committee members. Since around 1990, Akureyri has worked actively towards gender equality by appointing gender equality committees and making gender equality plans every four years. The main emphasis in our gender equality plans has been equal pay and gender mainstreaming. I myself participated in a Nordic gender mainstreaming project in the years of 1998 till 2000, while I was the director for sport and the leisure department of Akureyri, so I know this project very well, and fortunately I have had the opportunity to use this project and to uh, bring it in my job today. One could say that the pay equality is the main public decision in Iceland on gender equality. The Town Council of Akureyri decided in 2004 to work systematically towards pay equality amongst its employers. The result was quite good and the survey made in 2007 showed no significant pay gap. To follow up, another pay survey was made in the year of 2012. And the gap had unfortunately increased a bit. But that gives us the message that employers always need to be awake and aware of how things can change, although they are not supposed to change. The challenges we face in Akureyri and in fact whole Iceland are for example these. Firstly, although we have good educational opportunities for girls and boys, women and men, the educational gap seems to increase. Why are young men not entering junior colleges or are dropouts? 
and the university in the same amount as young women? And secondly, why is the labor market, market gender segregated? Will we be able to change this if we become more aware of gender perspectives and use the methodology of gender mainstreaming in our services and policy making? Question mark. The Town Council of Akureyri is interested in con uh, continuing working towards gender equality and to take gender mainstreaming into the budget. That is, to do gender budgeting. And to sum up, ladies and gentlemen, Gender equality is important for all communities, and we need both women and men to take active part in the society and also in the decision making. If we use our gender classes and use the method of gender main mainstreaming, for example, we should be able to do something about gender imbalances and make our communities of all sizes more attractive to live in for both women and men. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Edgar. Uh, we have uh, just a few minutes left, I'm afraid, until coffee and some fresh air. No, not some fresh air, but some, <laughs> some coffee. And, and uh, <clears throat> so I suggest that those with questions perhaps start with uh, uh, asking uh, uh, Edgar, and then uh, the rest of the panel is open to questions and queries. Thank you. Every, uh, I, was, I was on the top, yes. <laughs> well, then the floor is open to anyone who was, wants to comment. Erika. Erika Heifield. Yeah. Yeah, my name is Erika Heifield. I'm from the Faroe Islands. Um, it's a question with respect to the um, quotas that you implemented in Iceland in 2010. Generally speaking, I was wondered, uh, well, I know that it's, uh, I believe it's a similar system to the Norwegian. And my question is uh, really both, both to, in respect of Iakarairi, but also uh, Iceland in general, how has the labour market um, to, uh, implemented and, and what's been the response of, of the labour market to this, uh, to the quota system and um, is there a difference uh, in how it's been received in the more urban areas as, uh, as opposed to maybe the smaller areas like for example Acker area or even smaller areas than that where, where there may be more uh, uh, primary industries. Thank you Erika. Well, uh, uh, at first, there were quite negative uh, reactions, but uh, but now I think it it's, it has the, it has shifted, and and I I know the uh, the minister who has this on her her table. She she held a meeting uh, last year, and and you know it was in the discussion whether whether this should be changed back or and but the the, the companies the business said no 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 please don't do that we want to make it work so so i think it it has has shifted it it takes time we have seen uh, growing numbers of 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 women in on on boards but i i have i have not seen any analysis of of you know rural urban but that's a good question, something that we need to ask. Uh, oops. Rasmus Ole. Rasmus Ole Rasmussen from Norregio in Stockholm. Um, I have uh, a question that actually is directed both to Gunbrit and to Christine. Uh, because, uh, and, and definitely also to I recall um, because, uh, well, uh, you, you mentioned this about what has become attractive, or at least you opened up for the question of what has become attractive in your hometown. And, and uh, to me, I think uh, uh, the public services and public activities 
may play an important uh, role in that, that connection, and especially the the options for, well, let's say, participate in both worlds, uh, both the traditional activities and at the same time also enjoy the, the options for having a, a regular salary. Uh, I would like, very much like you to comment on this. Thank you, Rasmus, for that question. Yes, uh, of course, we are in the kind of modern indigenous peoples. So, uh, but what I think is important for the for maintaining sustainable communities is to manage to bring the traditional economies also into a modern economy. And to and what I forgot to mention in my earlier question is the opportunities I see is to make reindeer and fish products, more gourmet products, to make more money on the products, to make our, uh, but this is also uh, a tricky question, but to make our traditional uh, products, like cups like this, or, or not exactly the gakti, but to make design and develop design based on the traditional patterns, and in that way, to, to bring more money into the smaller communities also. And we have examples of of Sami women that are running their own design companies in, in communities like Karashok, where they use inspiration from the Sami gakti or Sami dresses and, and mass produce sweaters and skirts and so on based on, on the traditional patterns. And I think this is the ways of how we have to uh, ensure that we have this kind of business opportunities based on the traditional uh, culture. Um, yeah, I had another idea, but maybe I get that later, and maybe others have to, want to answer too. But one point to, to Erika here is that uh, what we also see in the Sami communities is that the, the bigger settlements, they, they are stable, but they have uh, uh, Sami parliaments maybe, and they have educational centers. So th the trend is that people in the smaller communities, my municipality has 900 inhabitants, but people from the smaller communities don't move to Oslo or Stockholm or Helsinki necessarily, they move to Tromsø, Karashok, Godgeinu, uh, Rovaniemi, which is also in the north. So they are the places that has managed to also attract people from the smaller communities. So they stay in the north, but not in the small communities. But I would like also the smaller communities to have opportunities to be sustainable. Thank you. Well, I, uh, the fact is, is that in, in, in Iceland, the, the fishing industry plays an e enormous role in our economy. It's very important, but, but the, the fi I would say the fishing industry is, is very male-dominated. And, and of course, uh, it, it would be uh, good to see, see more women there. And, and we need, of course, uh, not, not least in the rural areas, we, we need uh, all kinds of, of different jobs. And it's right, as you say, uh, the women are, are wor working very much in, in the public sector, while men are working on the private sector. And, and I th think it, it's just our, our very important for our, our work in the future to, to change this. You know, we want to see women and men everywhere. But of course, uh, people should be allowed to do what they want to do. But we can do a lot to encourage these, these changes with affirmative actions or, or, or with, of course, beginning where we should begin in the schools. Well, about the public sector, uh, what I wanted to point out is actually that there is a gap between uh, the, the capital area and uh, the districts outside of the capital area. And uh, people are actually dragged into that, uh, well, into, into there. So, and that's right, what my colleague said here, that of course we are gaining from that being uh, such a big uh, uh, municipality in this area here, because people of, of course are coming uh, to here. But what I actually meant was, we are gonna have, to, we can also support uh, the other uh, rural areas. And that's the main thing, that we are also, we are, we are not, although we have uh, equal uh, opportunities here in our uh, municipality, we are obligated 
to support the other municipalities as well. And that's what, what's, what's my point is actually. Uh, and I don't mean that, of course, we have to work a lot in the public sector because uh, the payment, for, for example, in the public sector is not that high. So that's uh, quite another issue to, to make a difference there. And of course, we have to have more equality in the public sector that we have today. So that's uh, another job. And of course, we're going to have to work on that as well. Thank you, Ergur. I'm, I'm afraid that we absolutely have to finish this uh, to keep to schedule. Uh, I thank the, uh, the uh, speakers and panelists for the contribution. I, I suggest we give them an applause. Just some very, a very practical note that those with PowerPoints and who haven't delivered them yet, if they could do that uh, and uh, accost the technician who sits there in the corner of the room, um, this specifically for the next, next session applies to uh, uh, Stephanie, Steph, and uh, Natalia. Thank you.